I um, want to thank everybody for logging in tonight. This is the Zoom webinar version of our annual rules meeting. Um, we had several meetings at various locations throughout North Jersey, um, but most of those sold out. They all had limited seating. And um, this is another option to get some of the information out to the coaches. The uh, slides you're going to see tonight, um, they were designed for referees. They were designed for coaches. Now, as we get going um, tonight, um, it's just me here. So I kind of move at a fast pace. If you have a question, I prefer you hold it to the end, even if we got to go back over something, because I can't monitor the, the Q&A in the chat and go through these slides at the same time. So we're going to try to move at a good pace to respect everybody's time. And uh, again, I, I'm happy to answer all the questions we have. But as I'm zipping through the slides, I'm not going to be monitoring the chat and Q&A until the end. So we'll get going here. All right. Welcome to our 2024 rules webinar for coaches. Um, Randy Mills from the NJJOL. I'm also in charge of the Garden State Lacrosse Officials Association. I do rules. I do assigning for the officials and training for the officials and coaches. So let's get started. There's three documents you need to be uh, familiar with for our league. The most uh, important document is this, the high school rule book. Everything defaults back to the high school rule book. There's also the USA Lacrosse Boys rule book. Um, we use this, but we make several modifications as a league. We've made several modifications to this, which you'll see as we go through it. So in other words, we don't follow everything in the USA Lacrosse rule book. There are several things that we've changed, which we'll go over as we go through the presentation. And then if you log into our league website, there's some documents you should be familiar with. And these are located, as you can see over here, njlacrosse.com slash rules. The first one is these are our playing rules. That's the primary set of documents. Everything defaults back to the high school rule book, but the, the primary document for us is the playing rules. Then below that, we have the rules and regulations. I mean, I'm sorry, the 7v7 uh, playing rules. Those are specific for 7v7. And then we have the policies and procedures. These are the things that are not about playing the game, but logistical things for the league about um, if a child is from a town that doesn't have a program, where can they play and, and league administrative type stuff. So you should be familiar with all those. They're all located at that link you see there to your right. So let's talk about coaches IDs. This is something new. Last year, we went through the process of, we started with the lanyard IDs and then we transitioned into the digital IDs. Well, there were uh, several issues with the lanyards. And uh, one is that if we had coaches signing up like this late in the year, like I still have coaches signing up even um, today for their digital IDs. Well, in the past, we would have had to send this to a vendor and it would take the vendor a couple of weeks to be able to produce the lanyard ID. And we had no way to get that coach on the sideline any sooner. So part of the way through the season last year, we transitioned over to the digital IDs and that's something that seemed to work for us very well. The other issue we had with the lanyard IDs was it was actually creating some friction and causing some friction before the games even started because unfortunately coaches were leaving their IDs at home, in their wife's car, at work and whatnot. And uh, they were getting in arguments with the referees who were not going to let them on the sideline for that day. So we transitioned to the digital IDs. So one change this year is that all coaches, including third grade coaches, must have a digital ID to be able to get to the sideline. And I'm here to say right now, the, uh, the digital ID has to be with you. You can't submit a photo, a screenshot, although the app doesn't really let you take screenshots. You can't go print out a bunch of paperwork from the USA Lacrosse website to show that you're uh, valid. You have to have your digital ID or the referee's instructions are that you're not coaching that particular day. If your battery on your phone is dead, well, you're out of luck that night. So try to make sure that doesn't happen. 
Just as a reminder, we allow four coaches on the sideline per team. This includes any junior coaches. Now, a junior coach is a coach who is under 18 years of age. Normally a high school kid, he might be helping you out. Well, if you want them on the sideline during the game, they also need to get one of these digital IDs. Um, but it's it's really easy. They can get they can take the courses they need to take in a matter of a couple of hours online. And they don't they don't require a background check, so it's really not hard for them to get their digital IDs. And other than that, the only person that's going to be allowed on the sideline, only adult that's going to be allowed on the sideline, is the home team's going to provide a timekeeper. And we're going to talk more about timekeepers later because it's kind of a point of emphasis about timekeepers this year. So, right now we're we're going to talk about timekeepers. Um, Youth lacrosse is uh, something where, you know, some programs have a, a visible scoreboard, some don't have a visible scoreboard, um, but the home team has to provide a timekeeper. We don't want the referees keeping the game time necessarily, especially for the stop time games. So, but you have to, as a home, as the head coach for the home team, you have to provide a responsible adult to be the timekeeper. The timekeeper cannot also be a coach. It happens all too often. In fact, I did some games this morning and it happened. I walked up and asked um, the coach who's keeping time today and he decided to appoint a coach. So my instructions to him are, well, that's okay, but now he's not coaching tonight. He's now a timekeeper because you are not going to be a coach and a timekeeper in the game. The timekeeper has to stay in the box area at all times um when they're keeping time the referees will give them some basic instructions and what we really recommend here coaches is go out now and get one of your parents to volunteer to be the timekeeper now it would be better if you got the same parent or one or two to do all your games because then they'll get good at it after a couple games but even if you got to rotate every game it's not rocket science anybody can do it but if you ask your parents or volunteers i, I think you'll very easily find people to volunteer and you don't have to worry about using your coaches but the timekeeper has to stay in the box area. They have to stay in the penalty box area. If there's not a visible scoreboard um, out, we want the timekeeper announcing every two minutes, just so everybody has a frame of reference of where we are in the quarter. And the timekeeper needs to be prepared to uh, time multiple penalties. Now there are some apps um, in the app stores for specifically lacrosse or taming, uh, timing of games. Um, I'm not going to recommend anyone in particular, but if you go search, you'll see there are some apps for the phone. So if you do get a parent or two to volunteer, they could download the app on their phone and that could help them keep uh, game time, especially if there's more than one penalty. So an exception to this is if a team only has one certified coach for any particular game, they are allowed to get a second adult to come down into the bench area with them. And that adult's only job is to supervise the non-playing players, the players that are in the bench area. This way the coach can concentrate on the field and we've got somebody supervising the kids in the bench. And if a kid comes off injured or there's some issues, you have an extra set of eyes. However, that's only if you have one coach. If you have two coaches with IDs, you do not get an extra adult to be a, a supervisor. Only if there's only one coach available. Here's something that um, we run into once in a while that um, if you're playing an out of area, out of state team, meaning not a North Jersey junior lacrosse league team, the other team's coaches, they don't need to have an ID. They're obviously not going to have our ID and whether or not they have their leagues or programs IDs, that's not our concern. But the one thing is though, if they're coming to us and they're playing a home game for you, they're playing by our rules. If they're coming from Connecticut and they say, hey, in sixth grade, we allow the, the uh, players to do one-handed checks, well, we don't here in New Jersey, and if we're playing the game in our area, we're playing by our rules. So this app has a lot of nice features other than the fact, you know, it's got some security features, which is great. But if you notice at the bottom here, there's a little thing that says additional card details. And if you click on that, you'll see that there's a link. Well, that link takes you to the league website where there's all types of great information on there about the season um, for the upcoming year. So it's just like a little quick way to get to um, the, the rules cheat sheets, um, the, the playing rules, who the referee assigners are, things like that's all located um, right there using that link. So now let's talk about player eligibility. And it is definitely important that head coaches are aware of this because ultimately you're responsible for the players you put on the field. So 
um, our insurance carrier uh, made us a couple years ago come up with an age maximum per grade. As you're aware, in our league, we do not play by the U levels, the U14, U12, U10. We play by grade level. However, we were required to put in an age maximum. So here's the date cutoffs. Coaches, you do need to make sure that your players are age eligible. And the only place that it really gets to be important is in eighth grade. Because in eighth grade, if they're too old, there's no place for them to go. If a fifth grader is too old or a sixth grader is too old, they just have to play up a grade level. But an eighth grader has no place to play in that case. The one thing I will say, though, is if you were to go to USA Lacrosse, the U14, which is the rules that we play in eighth grade, their age cutoff is September 1st, 2024. Meaning if you had a player who was 14 right now, but on August 30th, he turned 15, they're actually not, they wouldn't be eligible to play this season under U14 by USA Lacrosse. We've been six months more generous with that. So the uh, by, as long as they didn't turn 15 before 3-1, they're eligible. And that goes for every grade level there. Now, if you have a seventh grade player or any grade, but they're young enough to play the grade below, that is never okay. They can never play a grade level down. Um, they have to play in their grade level. The only exception would be is if they're too old to play in their grade level, they can play up one level. High school players are not eligible regardless of age. This really only comes into play for towns that don't have a high school program so there's no place for them to play but even if they're age eligible if they're in ninth grade they're not eligible to play in our league and as head coaches you're responsible to make sure that everybody on your roster is compliant now the fact that you've logged in here tonight is great um this is all uh, tracked by zoom because the fact that you decided to take additional training that you weren't required to take um is great for you moving forward in case there's any issues. One of the leading um, causes or things listed when either a coach or a referee is sued is that their training was deficient. They weren't properly trained. So this is great that you logged in here tonight. This is a whole nother level of training that you're gonna get. Now, if you haven't taken it already, um, I highly recommend that you take the what they call the Rutgers Safety Clinic. And New Jersey has something called the Little League Law. And the Little League Law gives some civil immunity to volunteer coaches who are out there trying to do the right thing. But the Little League Law requires you take a course, an approved course, and the Rutgers course is approved. There are other ones out there, um, but this is a great thing. A lot of towns, I know the town I'm in now, I live in Vernon, you can't get a field permit until you've shown that your coaches are all Rutgers certified because it also protects the town, it protects the program, it protects the coach. But there are some exceptions to this and that's if uh, it's determined you're grossly negligent. And the reason I bring that up now is one thing that could be considered gross negligence is if you had a player on the field who wasn't supposed to be there, meaning a player who was too old. If that player goes out there, they weren't supposed to be on the field and they injure somebody Little League law might not protect you. And that's why it's important that even though coaches, your program's giving you a roster, you want to double check and make sure that those kids are all eligible to be out on the field. Now, another issue that came up through USA Lacrosse and through our insurance carrier was the fact that there's something they call the 24 month rule, meaning that players are not allowed to be on the field with player other players that are more than 24 months difference in age. So because of that, we had to come out with a rule that says players can only play up one grade level. Well, if you're in a program that has a team at every grade level, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, that's not a big deal. Where this does come into play is for the programs that only have a combined third, fourth, a combined fifth, sixth, and a combined seventh, eighth. Because what it, this means is that a sixth grade player cannot play on a combined seventh and eighth grade team. A sixth grade player is not allowed on the same field with eighth graders and the same thing down the line, a fourth grade player cannot be on the same field with sixth graders and a second grader cannot be on the same field with fourth graders. So this is important. Uh, make sure we're complying with this rule because we don't want to have anybody who's not age eligible to be out there. And it is the coach's responsibility to comply with this. Now, one thing I'll say here is that the referees are not going to get involved in this. So 
if say you just finished the combined fifth, sixth grade game and the seventh, eighth grade game is about to start and you notice a couple kids are getting ready to play. Well, don't go to the referees and, and report it to them because it's not their job to enforce who is and is not allowed on the field. You got to work it out between you two coaches and if necessary, report back to your program director, let them know what happened so that they can send an email to the league and let us know what's going on. So the other thing is, under no circumstance can a player play down, like I said before, even if they're eligible by age. I don't. If it's a first-year eighth grader and they've got a zero skill level, they still can't play with the seventh graders. They have to play with the eighth graders. So once again, uh, sportsmanship is a point of emphasis for us. The NJJLL and really all youth sports, we're losing officials. Um, this is a problem nationwide. Uh, the, the retention rate for new officials is 30% after three years. So this year, the high school is training 83 new officials, which is great. Um, but the problem with that is that if this holds true, we're going to have 24, 25 of them left after three years, which is a problem. The reason these officials are leaving, leaving is adult behavior, the way the coaches treat them, the way the parents treat them. So we're again telling the referees that we want to take a zero tolerance. We're not going to listen to coaches yell at us. We're not going to listen to parents yell at us. And the referees are being given more tools to be able to enforce this. So we're encouraging the officials to call more unsportsmanlike conduct fouls and ejecting anyone who chooses to yell at the game officials. Now, here's something any experienced referee will tell you, that if the coaches are yelling at us, it's way more likely the parents are yelling at us because you're convincing the parents that they're not getting a, fame, a fair game out there. So you need to set the example. You need to set the tone. One thing that's unique about youth lacrosse, though, is that there's actually tools that the referees can hold the head coach or the team responsible for the conduct of the spectators. And we're going to talk about that and how that gets implemented. So one thing I didn't tell you when I started was a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in Kenilon. I So I'm fortunate that I was able to play this game when I was in middle school. And I moved to Vernon 30 some years ago. And I started the youth program here in Vernon with a couple other guys, Harry Shortway, Wade Warner. And so I've, I've run a program. I've been a coach. Both my boys played. My daughter played. All three of my kids played four years in college. So I've been a coach, a program director, a referee, and um, I've done them all for quite a long time. I've been a referee since 1998. Here's the thing that we're putting on the coaches and the programs that we need you to fix. I, as a referee, come over and I'm reporting to a coach. I say, coach, you see the guy up there with the red hair? And the coach says to us something like, oh, we have a problem with that guy every game. Well, we don't want to hear that. You should be fixing that. Coach, if you can't fix it, you need to get your programming director involved. We can't have the same parents deciding that they get to decide what's fair and what's not fair. So we're putting this on the programs. You need to identify these problem fans early in the season and address them accordingly. If not, you'll see that there are rules in place that this could come back on the team. And that's what we don't want. We don't want the kids paying the price for the actions of adults, particularly adults in the stands. So what can be considered unsportsmanlike conduct by a coach? Well, there's some obvious ones, yelling at the officials. Things like occur encouraging over-aggressive plays, you know, yelling things like take him out, make him pay for that. You know, why did he run the crease? He should be on his butt. Things like that. We don't encourage overly aggressive play. Yelling out and overruling officials' calls. And what do I mean by that? Well, I come over and I'm reporting a, a cross-check on – Five, number five, black, one minute call for a cross check and the coach decides to yell across the field. Don't worry, Pete, that was a great hit. Nothing wrong with it. Well, that's going to be an immediate flag. The referees know that. That's going to be an unsportsmanlike conduct on the coach. Now, there's nothing wrong if you do think that maybe it was a borderline or a bad call. When the kid comes off the field, if you want to talk to him one-on-one -on -one and you want to tell him that, hey, look, I think you got a bad call, or that's okay. What you can't do is yell across the field, contradicting the referee's call as if to show him up. And what is a coach going to say to us more often than not? Well, I wasn't saying it to you. 
I was saying it to my kid or I was saying it to my other coach. Well, here's the rule that here's how officials handle that. If you said something loud enough for us to hear it, you wanted us to hear it. So doesn't matter who you were talking to. If you're making a comment that wasn't appropriate and we heard it, we're going to deal with it. Some other things that can be sportsmanship issues are things like running up the score. Um, again, I coached for a long time. I refereed a lot of games and you get these games that are 12, 14, nothing or 12, 14, one. And it gets to the point where nobody's really having a whole lot of fun anymore because if the coach who's ahead is doing the right thing, he's probably starting to sub deep into his bench, which is great. Um, the problem is it's tough for a uh, coach to sub deep into his bench like that and then tell the players to go out there and not play, not shoot, not play the game of lacrosse. Cause a lot of times these are kids that aren't getting a lot of playing time. And the reason I bring that up now is if you're the coach on the other end of that, on the losing end of that, if he is doing the right thing and rolling deep into his bench, it's not the time for you to roll deep into your bench either. This is not the time for you to get those kids playing time because you need to try to keep this game competitive. Um, that's why we have rules in place um, at the uh, stop time level, seventh and eighth grades, the, you know, the, to accelerate the clock because it gets to a point where, you know, the games really aren't fun for anybody anymore when the score gets too bad. So we all need to try to do the right thing. And things like embarrassing the opponent. So if you're up eight, nothing, nine, nothing, and somebody scores, they shouldn't be celebrating like they just won the Super Bowl. Look, you score in overtime, everybody's, you know, that's fine. That's, that's great. Have some fun there. But if you're already up by a lot, you don't need to be uh, over celebrating. The other thing we don't want to be doing is uh, over celebrating uh, any contact or hits that are perceived on the field. That can also be considered poor sportsmanship, and that can actually be consequenced also at the referee's discretion. So let's go through some progressive discipline, um, and this is specific to coaches. If a coach get, gets ejected from a game, they're suspended the next game that's on their schedule, and they're subject to a $1,500 fine, uh, $1,500, $250 fine. A second ejection is a $500 fine, and that coach will not be on the sideline for the remainder of the season. And to be reinstated, the program director needs to write a letter and the board, the NJJLO board will review it. If a coach is ever ejected again um, in any year, they're then they're banned for a program. Uh, they're banned from the league forever and a $500 fine to the programs. These fines are to the program, not to the coach. If the program wants to kick it down to the coach, that's on to them. But the fines are to the program. So any coach who's ejected cannot be on the sideline. Coaches, this is the minimum progressive discipline. If a referee ejects you and you make a comment like, I'm not going anywhere, or you decide to try to get a piece of them the whole way off the field, well, when the referee writes that in his report, I can guarantee you, you're going to be suspended more than one game, right? Your, your suspension is going to go up. So if it happens, you need to do the right thing and you need, need to leave the site. And nothing here prevents the discipline committee from accelerating the discipline here. If what the coach did on his first defense was so egregious, they could ban him from life for the very first incident, depending on how bad it is that he did. Uh, the incident was that he did. So let's talk about progressive discipline for a uh, the spectators. So if we've got spectators yelling at us, unlike a high school game where we can go to the box area and ask for the site manager to go uh, deal with the fans up there, we will come over and we were going to talk to the team's head coach and we're going to offer him an opportunity to go talk to his fans to try to quiet them down. If they accept, they're charged a timeout. Um, but whether or not they accept and how they handle themselves moving forward is going to depend on how things go. So the, the, the referees are required to give the coach an opportunity to go talk to the fans. The coach is not required to do this, um, but this is how it starts. So the first offense, we talk to the coach, give him a chance to talk to the parents. After that, whether the coach did or did not take advantage of going to talk to the fans, if the fans keep it up, we can administer a one-minute non-releasable penalty to the team for the conduct of the fans. And then that could escalate to a three-minute non-releasable penalty and ejection um, of the fan or the spectator. And we can even end the game every year, multiple games get ended because towards the end, for whatever reason, um, whether it's fan conduct, whether it's the way the kids are playing, they just decide that this is not productive anymore. 
But here's what the referees are told. If you've got a coach who's working with you and trying to do the right thing, and the coach is not also part of the problem, because very often it's the coach yelling too, which is why the parents are yelling. But if you've got a cooperative coach and whatnot, we don't want the referees going through this process. We would rather just you eject the fan before it gets to the point that the team would be penalized. I can tell you from experience multiple times, I've ejected a parent and other parents on the same team clapped when that parent was ejected because very often the other parents are tired of listening to them too. But again, just like before, nothing prevents the officials or the league from escalating this. If what the parent says the first time or the spectator says the first time is egregious, they can be ejected immediately. We don't have to give the coach a chance to talk to them or whatnot. That's referee's discretion. This is the minimum progressive discipline for these type of issues. So players are also going to be held to a high level of sportsmanship. So what can be considered bad sportsmanship by a player? Showing palms. A lot of referees, this is like a pet peeve of theirs, meaning we call an obvious foul and they turn around with them, uh, turn around to us with their palms up. Well, that's a, that's disrespectful. Either leave the field, but don't sit there questioning our call because that's a form of questioning our call. Begging for calls, um, you know, to, say, making comments, things like that, that you don't think you're getting the calls you're supposed to get. And my personal favorite slash pet peeve is pointing at the helmet. If you've been around this game, you've probably seen it. Kids running down the field, maybe his helmet gets brushed with a stick and we decide we're not calling a slash. And while they're still cradling and running down the field, they're pointing at their helmet. Well, let me guarantee that if they point to their helmet like they think they just got slashed, they're going to, there's going to be a flag, but it's not going to be the flag they wanted because now they're going to go for unsportsmanlike conduct. Obviously, things like trash talking or taunting the other team, excessive celebration, and things like that. Um, over celebrating a big hit, things like that, that could be an issue. So a new rule that the league put in this year, um, based on some incidents that have happened in the past, and this really only applies if you're an eighth grade coach, is if an eighth grade player is ejected two or more times during the season for unsportsmanlike conduct, they're no longer eligible to participate in our all-star games at the end of the year. That's just important. Um, for everybody to understand. So no eighth grader who was injected two times for unsportsmanlike conduct during the season can play in the All-Star game at the end of the year. Here's just something that people need to understand because it's the same in high school, right? If Whether it's a player ejected or a coach ejected, there is no appeal process. Even if there's video footage to show the referees were 100% wrong and they made a mistake, right? They're going to be uh, suspended for the next game. And like it says here, they're going to be suspended at least the next game. Um, depending on how they handle themselves after that, depending on how the referee writes it up, the suspension could be longer than that. It's just important for everybody to understand. So let's review some of our unique youth rules. Well, one of the first things that we do differently than USA Lacrosse, if you were a coach last year, remember, USA Lacrosse came out and said that all penalties will be non-releasable. And that is how we started our season last year. However, after a couple of weeks, um, based on feedback from referees, from coaches, we got together as a league and the league decided they were going to roll it back. And now we're back to the way it's been. There are releasable and non-releasable penalties as called by the official. Just And this is something that if you're playing an out-of-area team, either out-of-state or a team that's not part of the NJJLL, make sure they understand this coming in because they might still play where all penalties are non-releasable. So let's get into stick length. It's really um, pretty easy when it comes fifth grade and up. They have to play with a stick that would be legal to play in a high school game, right? The length, the, 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 length, the pocket, the construction, everything has to be right. The only exception here is in third and fourth grade, they're allowed to use a stick that's a little bit shorter than um, the normal sticks, but it can't be ridiculously shorter. That's only three inches that they're getting there. We do allow long poles. Um, several years ago, USA Lacrosse decided to uh, only limit to three long poles for youth. And this slides in here because they did change back to four long poles. And in the NJJLL, we do not allow coaches to request stick checks. Uh, reason for that is if you've ever been involved in a game 
where if it gets to the point where a coach requests a stick check, the animosity level of the game of the level of the game is probably pretty high already. And as soon as the coach call, uh, starts calling for stick checks, the animosity level rises because once that stick check's done, one team's now uh, ticked off and the other team's pumped up and it just creates a bad environment. If you think you see a stick that you have an issue with, there's nothing wrong with you asking the official. The official may or may not decide to check the kid's stick. I, as a referee, might come over to the sideline, whether or not the other coach said anything, and I might just say, hey, coach, do me a favor. Next time 22 comes off, check his stick for me. I mean, I've been around this game a long time, and there's a lot of things that can be wrong with a stick that I can see without having to check their stick. And I'm telling you, if a referee gives you the courtesy of that, take advantage of it. Because if 22 runs off the field and I notice nobody checked his stick, well, guess whose stick is getting checked next time he comes out onto the field. So like we said, fifth through eighth grade, they must use a high school legal stick. However, if it's not legal, how we handle it is different. In seventh and eighth grade, it's just like high school. The stick's not legal, two-minute non-releasable penalty. In fifth and sixth grade, if the stick's not legal, no penalty, but the stick gets removed from the game. They can't play with the stick. Third and fourth grade, we're really just worried that they play with a safe stick. Um, you know, it, it needs to be the right length and whatnot, but we're not going to get involved in the shooting strings and whatnot so much in third and fourth grade. But one thing we do have to watch for in third and fourth grade is these fiddle sticks. And if you walk into a sporting goods store, you know, especially for a first time parent, and there used to be years ago, fiddle sticks didn't look anything like a regular lacrosse stick, but now they do. And as a parent who's not familiar with the game and you see one stick on the shelf for $35 and the other stick for $110, well, common sense is if they don't even know if their kid's going to like the game, they're going to try to buy the fiddle stick. Um, make sure coaches, the reason this slides in here is if you coach at this level, third and fourth grade, make sure you're looking at the sticks and make sure they're playing with a legal stick. Your programs, if assuming somebody went to one of the in-person room, uh, room meetings from your program, they were issued these cards. These cards are the scorecards that the referees use, but they're also shaped this way for a reason. They're designed to go into the stick, and as long as they go in there without any resistance, that stick's pocket, uh, or I should say the, the, the width of the bottom of the stick, has to be a minimum of three inches, and that's what this card is designed to make sure. As long as the card can go in there freely, it's a legal stick. Now we have some shooting string requirements that came out a few years ago. Um, here on the left, you got the U and the V pockets. They're now illegal. All shooting strings have to be within four inches of the top of the stick. And that's something the referees are going to measure. So on the right, we're good. On the left, we're not. <coughs> the other thing is any strings hanging off the stick can't be any longer than two inches. However, that is not a penalty. That is just a, hey, the stick can't come back in the game until you trim those strings because it could be a, a, a hazard. If they're too long, they could end up getting somebody in the eye or something. All right, so moving on from sticks. Over the last couple of years, um, the National Federation and USA Lacrosse have been making several rules to the face-offs. They're trying to make the face-offs more fair. So if you remember, one of the things they put in last year is no motorcycle grip. That front hand has to be uh, palm up, all right? They, no more motorcycle grip over the top. Now, here's a change from last year to this year. Last year, they changed the rule. And what they said is that the face-off middies must attempt to play the ball before they do anything else. Well, the issue is for someone who's up against somebody who's very good at face-offs, a dominant face-off middie, one of the strategies in the past was rather than try to clamp on the ball, they would just drive into them or basically body check them. Well, that's illegal, right? But with the rule change, another option would be that they just back out and play defense on the uh, on the uh, whistle. But last year's rule where it said you had to play the ball first didn't allow that unless they tried to clamp the ball first. Well, with this rule change, all it says now is that the face-off middies cannot initiate contact while they're crouched over. So they can't drive into each other. They can still box out and spin around, things like that, but they can't drive into each other to try to force each other off the ball. That would be an illegal body check. So the rule a couple of years changed a couple of years ago, though, also was that knees cannot be on the ground for the face-off. However, it's not a violation if they go down and their knee touches, as long as by the time the referee says set, 
their knees are off the ground and that the knee doesn't touch the ground after they say set. So by the time, uh, by the time the face off starts, it needs to look like this, no knees on the ground, front hands are palm up and that's a good face off position. They're ready to go. So we also know now that if a player is going to clamp and get the ball in the back of their stick, they've only got one step to get it out of the back of the stick. Um, some of the face-off middies, especially at the older levels, they're so good. They're almost like magicians. They can get that ball spun around so quick. But 10 years ago, you could get the ball in the back of your stick. You could run on the field. You could shoot and score with the ball in the back of your stick. As a face-off middie, you can't do that anymore. You also can't trap the ball, lie on the ball. Once you get the clamp, you've got to immediately start to move the ball and um, pick it up with one continuous motion. And if you do clamp, you have to, again, move the ball right away. You can't look to your left, look to your right, see which of your uh, winging guys are open. Um, the ball has to be moved immediately. Now, this is not going to get enforced in third and fourth grade as tightly as it's going to get enforced in seventh and eighth grade, but the ball still needs to be moved. The days of clamping and spinning around, looking for which guy is open to pop it to, they don't exist anymore because now that would be a violation. So this has been a point of emphasis the last couple of years uh, due to the rising concussions, and that is having a properly fitted helmet. So helmet needs to fit properly. The chin strap should be worn uh, safely secured as designed by the manufacturer. All four points need to be secure. So here's what, um, if you went to the convention a couple of years ago, they didn't have one this year. Uh, they told us, um, and they told the coaches, if a player can take his helmet off, without undoing the bottom two straps, that helmet is not properly adjusted. So coaches, if you see it, make them adjust it, make it correct. There is a new rule this year about helmets if they come off during play. It's not a penalty. However, if a player's helmet comes off during play, the referees are gonna kill the play right away. And the player whose helmet came off has to leave the field until the following dead ball. So let's explain that for a minute. Okay, so if the helmet comes off during play, oh, unless a, a somebody's in the act of shooting, that's the only reason the referee's going to delay uh, his whistle for even a second. The referees are going to kill the play. If um, the player was the victim of an illegal body check and they went to the ground and their helmet came off, all right, they still have to leave the field. All right. Now, if that's the case, you're you're going to go man up, but when they say the, the next dead ball following the resumption of play. So what that means is the player's got to go to the sideline. We're going to restart play. They cannot re-enter the field until we stop to play again. And then he can re-enter the field. So the question comes up, can a coach use a timeout to get the player back on? Let's say you're going man up and this is your best left-handed attackman who lost their helmet. Well, the answer to that is no, a timeout does not get the player back on the field. You can't call a dead ball timeout and get that player back out onto the field. However, if you're getting the ball back, what you can do is tell the referee, Mr. Referee, as soon as you start play, I want a timeout. So that would meet the requirements of this rule. So if you're getting the ball back, you've got your best player on the sideline. We whistle the ball back in play. You ask for a timeout. We kill it. You now get your timeout and that player can come back on the field when we resume play. However, if you're on the other side of that and you're not getting the ball, and this is whether it's man up or not man up, um, you, you don't have that option. You have to wait till the next dead ball. Um, the referees blow the whistle the next time before the player can come back on the field. So again, unlike football, whereas if the helmet comes off and it's a as a result of a penalty in football, the, the player does not have to leave the field. In lacrosse, they do. If the helmet comes off, it doesn't matter whether it was the player's fault or not. They have to leave the field. Visors. Go through this every year. Every year I get a couple upset parents, upset coaches that they spent a lot of money on this kid's visor. Well, the rule is very clear in lacrosse. Only clear visors can be worn. There's no amount of tinting that's legal. If it's got any reflection, uh, reflective ability to it, um, if it's tinted at all, it's not legal. And unlike some other sports, even if there's a doctor's note, it does not allow a tinted visor. There's nothing that makes a tinted visor legal in youth lacrosse. 
Now, however, a player is allowed to wear sunglasses. And if they wear sunglasses, though, they're not allowed to wear even a clear visor. The reason being, if they did uh, uh, get a, a, a bad hit and they're laying on the ground, the medical staff needs to be able to get those sunglasses off so they can assess their condition. And it's hard to do that without manipulating the head and neck if there's a clear visor on there. So they can wear sunglasses, but they cannot wear sunglasses and a clear visor. Eye shade. I'm not a big fan of this rule, but it is a rule. And it's going to be enforced much more strictly this year from varsity high school right down through youth. The bottom line is the only thing that they're allowed is what you see here on the, the smaller picture to the left. One straight swipe underneath each eye. They're not allowed triangles. They're not allowed any tribal paint to the right like you see. They're not allowed any words in it or logos in it or numbers in it like the decals that you see that they make. One black stripe is all they're allowed. Now, while we're on the subject of eye black, something that's become uh, more popular and we've seen in some of the summer leagues over the last couple of years is kids using eye blacks on other part of their bodies, almost kind of like a temporary tattoo. And while there's nothing uh, specifically forbidden, forbidden about that, the one thing I will say is one of the things that became popular for kids to put on, whether it was on the back of their leg, on their arm, was they would do a smiley face with the X out eyes, which is the knock you out emoji. And anything like that would be considered taunting and that would be a penalty. So if a player does have excessive eye black on, it is a penalty and it is a one minute non-releasable foul in proper equipment. So coaches, the very first game you go out there, if you see kids, they're allowed the one swipe, they're not allowed to paint their faces. So let's talk about legal contact now, and we'll start with sixth grade and below, where we're, we do not allow body checks in sixth grade and below, but there is allowable body contact. Legal holds, meaning if a player is coming at them, they can use equal pressure to keep them from advancing. Legal pushes. And what I'm talking about here is like if a player is running out of bounds, they're allowed to bump the other player out of bounds. But what they're not allowed to do is knock them out of bounds so hard that they go head over heels. So they are allowed to push somebody legally out of bounds from the front or the side. Equal pressure. It's pretty much like I said before, a legal hold. They don't have to let players advance. You're allowed to man ball box out because you're not initiating contact there. You're protecting an area. And then defensive positioning to redirect an opponent in possession of the ball. Well, what that means is, you know, sometimes coaches ask, well, what are my poles supposed to do? Just let the attackman dodge to the goal? Well, no, it's just like basketball. You can get in the player's way. You have to do it legally. But what you can't do is get in the player's way and then drop your shoulder into them. Now, once you initiate a body contact like that, you drop your shoulder, that's a body check, and that would be the difference there. So they can certainly get in their way, all right? But what they can't do is drop a shoulder. They can do that when they get in seventh grade, or as long as they do it legally. They just can't do it um, sixth grade and below. And then the other thing is any contact deemed incidental by the officials. And this happens, I happen to referee football, basketball, and lacrosse. Incidental contact happens in all three of those sports. The way it might most often happen in lacrosse is you got a ground ball rolling away and player A is coming from the right. He's got his head down. He's concentrating on the ball, going to pick it up and be a B. Player B is coming from the left. Same thing, head down, concentrating on the ball. And now they hit. Helmet to helmet, they both roll over, they're both hurt, and the coaches, the parents, everybody thinks, well, somebody's got to have a foul there. Well, as a referee, we got to determine, did somebody intend for that contact to happen? If we felt one player initiated the contact or meant for it to happen, then yes, we have a flag. But it could be that it was just incidental contact, and that does sometimes happen. So the fact that there's no body checks in sixth grade and below doesn't mean that there's not going to be any body contact. Obviously. You know, we're playing boys lacrosse. There's going to be some body contact. So allowable contact now for seventh and eighth grade. To be a legal hit, it needs to be from the front of the side, above the waist, below the neck, and you have to have two hands on your cross, right? Anytime a player takes one hand, puts the cross in one hand and then drops his shoulder, that's an illegal body check by rule. Now, any contact that you're going to initiate the, the only distance you're allowed to run at them before you hit them is in youth lacrosse, it's three yards or what we call two steps. 
In high school, it's five yards or roughly three steps. It's referee discretion. Sometimes they might run a lot further, but just before impact, they let up and the referee might let that go. That's referee's discretion. But they're not allowed to run, you know, eight, 10 yards, drop the shoulder and hit somebody. That would be an illegal body check. So the intent should have been to accomplish lacrosse play, not to punish the other player. And that's pretty obvious when you see it. So unlike high school, where as long as you do everything legally, you know, a big hit's a big hit. Any excessively big hit in, in youth lacrosse is illegal, even if it was done technically right. You're not allowed to blow somebody up in youth lacrosse. Targeting. Targeting is, targeting is when the in the referee's opinion, the other player intentionally uh, took aim at the opponent's head or neck with the purpose of making violent contact. Um, if the referees determine it is targeting, it should be a three-minute penalty and possible ejection on the first offense. Um, that's a very serious offense. So now let's talk about one of the biggest rule changes in a long time in USA lacrosse is now we do allow one-handed checks in seventh and eighth grade. We do not allow them in fifth and sixth grade. USA lacrosse, I believe, allows them U12 level. We do not. That is also something else you're going to want to make sure if you're playing an out-of-area team that they're familiar with that we do not allow the sixth graders and below to do one-handed checks. We only allow it in seventh and eighth grade. However, what the referees were told is the stick checks need to be under control, right? They've got to get stick. They've got to get glove. But here's something that's important for coaches to understand. Even if, and this includes a one-handed or a two-handed check, even if they get all stick or all glove, if they swing excessively hard, it's a slash, right? You could still break somebody's finger if you swing too hard. So they're not allowed to go out there and just swing as hard as they want. If the referee determines that they swung too hard, it was too aggressive, it's a slash, even if they get all stick or even if they get all glove. And on the other end of that, if they swing and it's just a crazy dangerous swing and we're just lucky they missed, if the referee wants to, he can call a slash even if they didn't make any contact. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't happen often, but they can do it. And now another thing that we're going to start to see again that we never saw when there was not, uh, when we weren't allowed to do one-handed checks is the wrap check hold. So unfortunately, this being a webinar, I can't demonstrate what that looks like, but it's normally when somebody's chasing another player and they use one hand to wrap around in front of the other player to try to make a stick check, which is not illegal. However, if they don't make contact on the stick of the glove, a, it could be a slash, but also if any part of their body hits the back of the player, if they put their hand on the back, if they, if they chest goes into the player's back, that can be at the referee's discretion, a wrap check hold. They're not allowed to make contact with the back of the player while they're doing a wrap check. And where we get most uh, trouble with these wrap checks and whatnot is in what I like to call the danger zone. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. All right. Here we got an attackman and a midi, and the midi now, uh, the goalie just made the save, and the goalie passed it to the green midi here, and the attackman's going to be riding him uh, while the midi tries to clear. So what typically happens? The, the attackman's riding him, he's trying to check him, he's trying to get the ball on the ground. So I'm going to tell you from 30 years of coaching and refereeing experience that when that attackman, or it doesn't matter who's riding, once they get in that last 10 yards, the chances of something bad happening are way greater than the chances of something good happening. Obviously, they're trying to put the ball on the ground, all right? But the chances of them either A, taking a slash, B, jumping off sides, or C, holding them when they try a wraparound check are way greater than the chance of them actually putting the ball on the ground. And even if they are successful and get the ball on the ground, then you only got a 50% chance that you're going to get the ball anyway. So I highly recommend you tell your, your players that last 10 yards, be real careful in there because the chance of something bad happening for the riding team is much greater than the chance of something good happening. Because even if they did it right and they got the ball on the ground, there's only a 50-50 chance you're going to get the ball back anyway. So just be very careful because referees know this is where a lot of slashes happen. Players chasing, they take one last swing and they end up getting the kid in the shoulder, the bicep, the thigh, the hip. And now you're going man down when they should have just let it go. So sixth grade and below, we'll talk about allowable stick checks. 
We do not allow one-handed checks. Like I said before, we only allow the two-handed checks. However, the rules in the past about poking, lifting, and checking down um, don't apply anymore. They are now allowed to what we call a slap check. But again, they're not allowed to chop wood out there. They're not allowed to be swinging like they're trying to chop down a tree. So any stick swinging needs to be under control. And you should still encourage your players to poke check and lift check. So I'm going to pause now for a second because some people signed on late. Um, because I'm doing this by myself and I don't have anybody else monitoring, I'll try to hold your questions to the end because I'm not monitoring the chat right now. I'm not monitoring the Q&A. So if you could try to remember your questions at the end, I'll go through everyone. I'll try to answer everybody's questions, but I'm not going to be doing them live as we go through here um, because I'm just going to keep moving at my normal pace. I'm not going to keep stopping to try to read the chat or the Q&A. We'll get to that later. So goalie slashing. This really only happens in youth. It doesn't happen in high school very often. Goalie makes a save. And now you got normally an attackman is going to stand in front of the crease with his stick up and try to obstruct him from making his clearing pass. And we all know that if there's contact there, there can be a free clear for the uh, clearing team. However, the goalie has to be trying to make a pass. If in the referee's opinion, there was no legitimate attempt to make a pass and the goal was to strike the other player on the head to try to get the free clear, well, that can actually be a slash on the goalie. Now, depending on how bad it is, when I see it happen the first time, if it's not too bad, I might warn the goalie, say, goalie, next time you got to be trying to make a pass. If I think you're trying to hit him on the head, you're going to get a slash. And then I'll go try to tell the, the coach, hey, coach, I just warned your goalie. But if it's bad enough, even the first time, then I might uh, have to take the penalty um, right from the beginning because we can't just let them take advantage of the rule. The other thing is, and this does happen in high school sometimes, um, you know, this happens when an attackman's open, there's a long pass coming, and the goalie decides he's not going to let him catch that pass and does it by an illegal body check. Because in the sport of lacrosse now for the last several years, you cannot check anybody, even in seventh and eighth grade where body checks are allowed, you can't check them if they didn't know they were about to be hit. You can't hit somebody in a vulnerable position. The goalie can come out and play defense. They can check their stick once the ball's within five yards. They can legally... Um, play defense, but you can't come out and light somebody up who is sitting there waiting for a pass to come in. And one thing about youth lacrosse is at the referee's discretion, he can decide that the goalie doesn't have to serve his own penalty. Um, you can They can take someone else off the field. Um, it should be another defensive player from the other team. However, that's referee's discretion. If we've got a goalie who's acting like a knucklehead and has made a couple mistakes, the referee can say, you know what? You're serving your own penalty. So if that's the case, hopefully you have another goalie or we're not going to finish the game. So we don't have a big problem with this, but we want to make sure that the goalies are uh, understand that they are allowed to stay on the field for the sake of time. And not a lot of programs have backup goalies, but they can't take advantage of the rule. So now we're going to go through some clarifications. Here's a clarification. And you know, goalkeeper or any player in possession of the ball, A, brings his cross back through the plane of the goal. So what they're talking about it now, and unfortunately, this is one I'd love to demonstrate, and I do in the in-person meeting, the goalie makes the save. Now, while the ball's in their stick, they reach back to make their pass, and their stick hits the netting, the ball crosses the line. Well, that is not a goal. And I've seen that happen many, many, many times over the years. All right, That is not a goal. And that's pretty obvious, because what the rule says is that a loose ball has to uh, cross the goal line. But what B here says is they bring a ball back. Maybe when the stick hits the net, the ball fouls, uh, falls out and, it, and it's on the other side of the goal line. Well, that is still not a goal. Because again, the way, the way the rule reads is that a loose ball, the ball had to have rolled across the goal line or went across the goal line in the air. And the fact that it crossed the goal line while it was in someone's possession means it is not going to be a goal. Now, this was the original wording, which they had to put out a clarification for. And so in legal, in, in, in part A, where the goalie just brings it across, there's no goal. We know that. But in B, there's no goal. But if he dropped the ball behind his line, the ball gets awarded to team B. And where it got a little confusing is, who is team B? Because in the rule book, typically team B is the team on defense. However, was it clear that once the goalie made the save, is his team now team A? 
or is his team still team B? Well, the thing is that goalie's team is now team A once he caught the ball. So if the goalie brings his back, drops the ball on the other side of the goal line, um, and the ball hits the ground, the referees are going to kill the play, and the ball goes back to the offense outside the box. So I've never seen that happen in 26 years of refereeing. All right, but it could, and it obviously has happened, so that's why the rule's there. So let's do some reminders of our league rules. In youth lacrosse, if a player gets three personal fouls or five minutes of personal foul time, they fouled out. So this could happen in as little as two fouls if they get a three-minute and a two-minute foul, which could happen, um, or three personal fouls. But So understand the difference between personal fouls and technical fouls. Technical fouls are 30 seconds, things like holding, offsides, interference, um, illegal procedure. Those do not count. The time doesn't count, and they don't count as one of the three fouls. It's the one minute or more penalties, slashing, uh, cross-checking, illegal body check, those type of things. If they get three of those in a game, they fouled out. So if one of your players takes a cross-check in the first quarter, and then they accidentally trip somebody in the second quarter, well, if they get one more foul, they've now fouled out of the game. However, that's not an ejection. Um, it's just like in basketball, they fouled out. They're just done for the game. There's no future consequence. Some other rule reminders are in sixth grade and below, you're allowed to get a horn. But to get the horn, the ball has to go out of bounds. So USA lacrosse rule says the ball has to go out of bounds on a sideline. We're even more lenient than that. It can go out on an end line, meaning behind the goals, all right? But it's got to go out of bounds. If we've got a loose ball push on the field and we're going the other way, um, a coach is not entitled to a horn there. And, and coaches in sixth grade and below, if we've got a dead ball and the ball will, and ball goes out of bounds and you want to sub, just yell horn. 10, 15 years ago, everybody had a horn on their sideline and you would actually hit a horn. Now nobody seems to have that anymore. But if the coaches just yell horn, 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 we know now that you want to sub. But remember, the ball has to go out of bounds. And what the referees are told is this. If I've got a loose ball push, I go this way, and a coach yells horn or subs, and he starts subbing his players, well, at that point, the referee is going to let him complete that sub. But then he's going to go over and warn the coach. He's going to say, coach, that ball did not go out of bounds. You are not entitled to a horn there. If you do it again, you're going to take a delay a game penalty, meaning if it was your ball, you're going to lose it. If it wasn't your ball and the other team was entitled to it, you're going to go man down for 30 seconds. So horns are a great tool at the younger levels to get players on and off the field, but the ball has to go out of bounds. Remember in seventh and eighth grade, we're encouraging the officials to do two random stick checks during the game. Make sure the sticks are legal. Flag down, slow whistle. This was a rule change several years ago now. Used to be, didn't matter, high school varsity. Once a flag was down, any as soon as the ball hit the ground, uh, uh, other than on a bounce shot, the flag down was over. Well, now they went to a slow whistle. So we're not doing this in the same in fourth grade and below as we are in seventh and eighth grade. Seventh and eighth grade, we're doing it just like high school. We're going to hold our whistle until there's a, um, a goal scored, ball goes out of bounds, or some other dead ball is created. But fifth and sixth grade, it's referee's discretion. If the ball's been on the ground a long time and nobody's got a clear advantage and the referee wants to kill it, they're entitled to kill it. Third and fourth grade, we should just be killing it. We're not going to, if the once the ball's on the ground, nobody's really got an advantage anymore. But this is referee discretion. Other than um, seventh and eighth grade, it should be enforced like high school. Now, here's something, coaches, especially my older seventh and eighth grade coaches. This is something that started a couple years ago where the, mostly it's the long poles. They buy the smallest arm pads they can get. And as long as their arm pads made for lacrosse, they can do that. But then they decide they don't want to wear them on their elbows. They want to wear them up on their biceps. I did some games this morning. And after giving the team a warning, I had to assess a penalty for this because this is a safety issue. The team was warned that the poles need to keep the arm pads over the elbows. And then just a few minutes later, another long pole came on and his arm pads were up on his biceps. And that's a one minute non-releasable penalty for improper equipment. You have to wear the equipment as the manufacturer intended. So remember in this rule in this league at any level, eighth grade and down, there's a six goal mercy rule. Meaning if a team gets ahead by six goals, the other team rather than facing off is entitled to the ball at mid at midfield for what we would call a free clear. 
let's talk about changing sticks on the field. And what we're talking about for the most part here is the face-off middies. Um, not necessarily a FOGO, because a FOGO, meaning face-off, get-off, um, they normally run off the field. But you might have the kid uses a different stick on the face-off, which they're allowed to do. But once they've won that face-off and they've made their pass, they have to come to the sideline. They have to leave the field, exchange sticks, and come back on the field. What we see sometimes is they'll run towards the sideline. The coach is standing there holding the other stick, and then they throw their stick into the box area. Well, as soon as that stick hits the air, I'm blowing my whistle. It's over the because your team has the ball. We're killing it. The other team's getting the ball. You cannot throw the sticks. You're not supposed to do the exchange on the field. Sometimes the referees let you get away with a little bit of it as long as the coach doesn't come on the field. But the rule is you have to come off the field and hand-to-hand -hand exchange sticks. No sticks can be thrown. And fast restarts. This was a rule change from a couple years ago, and it is an important one. And there is a reason why. What we mean by fast restarts is now when we got a dead ball, particularly when we got something like a loose ball push, we're going the other way. The team that's getting the ball picks it up. But now as referees, what we used to have to do if the other team player was too close, and this was true in high school varsity too, we'd have to say, give them five yards, give them five yards. And sometimes we'd have to say it two or three times. Well, it got to the point where some higher level programs were actually coaching their kids to take their time to get that five yards because it was now giving their team time to get their defensive middies on, to get their long pole on. So they came out with this rule change several years ago, meaning if the team who's entitled to the ball has it, we no longer have to wait for anybody to get five yards away. We can restart play. And if that any player who's within five yards of that player, when we do restart play, attempts to play the ball, we now have flagged down Used to be called delay a game. Now it's a legal procedure. So we're not doing this in third and fourth grade. The referees are told, still make the players get five yards away. Fifth and sixth grade, for the most part, same thing. Still make them get, you know, five yards away. They can do it in fifth and sixth grade if they want to, the referees, but they really shouldn't. Seventh and eighth grade, though, we want this like high school. So if they pick it up, the other team player might be standing right next to them. We're allowed to, we're going to restart play. And as, and as long as they don't engage that other player, there's no foul. But if they do anything, including putting a stick in the passing lane, they do anything before they got five yards away from them, that's going to be a flag down. Now, keep in mind, this includes if they run shoulder to shoulder, 40, 50 yards down the field, the player without the ball had to have gotten five yards away from the player with the ball before they're allowed to engage them and play defense, or it is still a penalty. So we're going to do some rules clarifications. The first one's going to be rewarding. Now, again, this is one I normally like to demonstrate, but um, really hard to do in a, in a webinar. But if a player's got two hands on his stick and he's cradling and a defender's got his, arm, uh, his stick under the player's elbow and he's trying to lift up the bottom hand and trying to lift up the bottom hand and the player takes his hand off on the bottom and wraps it over his head, almost like a swing move, and then re-grabs a stick at the bottom. That is not a ward, right? They're allowed to take their hand, uh, get their hand out from under the defender's stick as long as they, when they took their hand off, they didn't push the other player away or they didn't use it to deflect the other player's stick. So when it happens, normally parents in the stands will start yelling ward and sometimes coaches do too. So the simple fact of taking your hand off the stick and putting it back on is not a ward unless they used it to intentionally direct the stick of the other player or the body of the other player. Holding stick on stick. Well, here's the rule. If the ball's within five yards, there is no such thing as holding stick on stick. A defensive player or a player on the other team can use their stick across your stick to keep you from picking the ball up, keep you from moving your stick forward. They can check your stick out of your hand, assuming they do it legally, as long as you're within five yards of the ball. There's not holding if it's stick on stick. Now, if they do the same thing more than five yards away from the ball, then that could be considered holding. Another clarification is the goalie gets five seconds. So what we're talking about here is I think everybody is probably aware that if there's a shot on the goal and the goalie decides to sprint for the end line to try to get the ball back, all right, unlike college where we're going to restart play as soon as that offensive player is ready, the goalie gets five seconds and the referee is going to normally do a visible, visible five-second count. But this also includes anywhere on the field. So if the goalie makes the save and he runs down across midfield, he's in the other team's offensive zone, and we get a dead ball whistle, the goalie still gets five seconds to get back, but he only gets five seconds. So again, the referee should do a, a visible five-second count. 
and restart play, whether or not the goalie makes it all the way back. So five seconds on restarts. This um, happens in high school more than it happens in youth, but at the higher levels, it happens in youth too. So let's say we have a shot on goal and there's a ball available for the uh, offensive player to pick up or he's holding the ball, but they, they're not stepping on the field. All right. Because they have to immediately come on the field for us to restart play. Well, as a referee, you're going to get five seconds. All right. So we're going to start a visible. If you don't step on the field right away, we're going to start a five second count. And if you're not on the field for us to blow the whistle within five seconds, assuming the ball was available to you, you could lose the ball. The other place where this happens in youth more often is let's say there's a shot on goal and the defensive team's getting the ball back. Well, you tech if there's balls on the end line, you technically only have five seconds to get that ball back in place. So if you're going to want a shorty to go take the ball, they better be running like Sonic the Hedgehog to get there. Because as a referee, if I see they're busting their butt to get there, I'm probably going to let it go. But if they're not, we can start our five second count. We're not looking to do this a lot in third and fourth grade, fifth and sixth grade. They need to start learning the rule, but certainly seventh and eighth grade, this needs to be um, penalized or adjudicated like it would be in high school. And then something called a cross check hold. Again, not able to visually demonstrate it for you here, but it used to be illegal to use the portion of the stick between your hands to keep a player from advancing. So the player's got his hands in a face-off position. I mean, in a cross-check position, his hands are shoulder width apart. It used to be illegal to use the stick to keep the player from moving forward. Um, they changed the rule because nobody ever called it. So now that is legal as long as the hands are shoulder width apart. So if they're on a long pole, their hands can't be way out extended. But what they can't do is uh, from a cross-check hold, they can't start now popping them, meaning bringing their hands back and popping them. Even if it's only six, eight inches, that'll hurt. So they're allowed to use it to keep them from advancing, but they're not allowed to be driving it into them in little mini cross checks because that can be considered a cross check. Uh, USA lacrosse, it was, this was an experimental rule a couple of years ago. And what this is, it's called a misconduct foul. And it's an opportunity, it's a way for a referee to um, fix something before uh, something bad happens. So what this is, is it's the referee's ability to remove a player from the field for anywhere from one to five minutes based on what's going on on the field. So what I'm talking about is this, a player who's running around and we can clearly tell they're just looking for somebody to hit or somebody to slash, whether they're frustrated because they got the ball checked out of their stick. They didn't get a penalty to call that they thought they should have got. They got knocked to the ground. Used to be, we had to wait for them to do something before we could penalize it. Now they're supposed to go talk, talk get the coach to try to talk to the kid. But if that doesn't work, we don't have to wait for them to do something bad. We can blow the whistle. We could say 49 blue, coach, 49 blue. I'm giving them a three-minute misconduct. What that means is um, you're not going to be man down, but that player cannot re-enter the game for three minutes. Now, this could also be in addition to a foul. So let's say we didn't get it in time and um, 49 cross-check somebody. Well, I can come over and I can report 49 blue, one-minute personal foul for a cross-check, but I'm also giving them a five-minute misconduct. Well, that means you are going to play man down for that first minute, but that player cannot re-enter the game for five minutes. It's another tool for the referees to use. Um, it doesn't get used often, but I can definitely think of times where I could have used this rule because I knew that somebody was out there looking to do something that wasn't going to be good. So this screen just gives you an idea what these scorecards look like. And again, if you had somebody from your program attend one of my rules meetings in person, um, they were given a packet of these. Um, to hand out to the head coaches. On the left is just a cheat sheet of some of the rules. On the right is the actual scorecard that the referees use um, during the game to keep score and track penalties and things like that. So now we're getting into the home stretch a little bit. We're going to get into some game timing rules. We're just going to do this quickly, just so coaches have an idea of what the, uh, the timing is supposed to be. Sixth grade and below, we play 12 minute running time quarters. You can agree to play less if like light is an issue or whatnot. You cannot agree to play more. The clock stops for all timeouts. We don't have any 10 or 20 second counts. We don't have any over and back and we have no keep it in. The only time violation we have is the goalie still has four seconds to get the ball out of the crease. There's no overtime in sixth grade and below, regardless if the teams agree or not. And here's a rule change. In the past, um, 
we didn't go man up, man down in fourth grade. Now even fourth grade has time serving penalties. So it's just like the rest of the grade levels. We do have a new mechanic in, face, um, in place for 7v7 games, which I'll go through in a minute. Um, there's not man up, man down, but there's a new way that we're going to uh, implement or handle how we do penalties. Now, here are some rules. These were USA lacrosse rules that the league adopted. For these running time games, during the last two minutes of the game, not of halftime, just the game, if there's a two-score difference, meaning it's a tie game, one goal or two goals, we go to stop time. And there's a reason for that. And if you've played indoors or in tournaments, um, you know, let's say that there's 40 seconds left to go. You're down by a goal. You shoot on goal. The ball misses. There's no end line balls. Well, if you don't have any timeouts left, the game could expire while you're looking for a ball. So last two minutes, if it's two goal game, one goal game or tie game, we, um, we go to stop time. If the team that's up by two scores and we go up by three, we go back to running time. And like I said, um, if it's tied, we play stop time too. Seventh and eighth grade, we play 10 minute stop time quarters. All high school counts are in effect. We play over and back. We have keep it in if it's a uh, less than a five goal lead. And just to clarify that, if the team's up by four goals, they have to keep it in. If they're up by five goals, they do not have to keep it in. And one little difference between high school is in the second half, if there's a 10 goal difference, um, we go to running time. Now in high school, that's a 12 goal difference. So, and a rule change a couple of years ago is once it goes to running time, it stays running time. It used to be that once you got there, if they scored and now it was a nine goal lead, we went back to stop time. Once you get to running time, the game stays running time. Um, there's two overtime periods shall be played um, during the regular season. This is for seventh and eighth grade. An exception to that is in eighth grade. If this is one of those games that go, counts towards their standings, which coaches, you should make sure the referees know this before the game even begins. If that's the case, then you're going to play as many overtimes as you need because we need a winner for the standings. So some other things during running time games, penalties don't start until we resume play. Seems like common sense, but there's been times where we give somebody a 30 second penalty players are running off and on. We restart play and the players running on. And then the time keeper said to us, well, I started the penalty time when he got to the penalty box. Penalty time does not start until we restart play. All right. And here's something that um, makes timekeeping a little more confusing at the lower levels. The games are running time, but penalties are stop time. So you have to have the ability to keep a game clock running, but stop it when the ball goes out of bounds if there's a stop the penalty clock. So same logic applies. Let's say you, uh, you're going man up for 30 seconds and you shoot five seconds in, ball goes behind the end line and there's no end line ball. Well, you shouldn't lose your whole man up uh, looking for an end line ball. So penalty times are stop time in the running time games. And this is just a clarification. What this says is if there's time remaining on a penalty when a goal is scored, the earliest the penalty uh, will released is when the ensuing faceoff is completed. So what that means is let's say this is, would be on a non-releasable penalty. The team was scored upon and there's six seconds left in the goal or, or the penalty, eight seconds left, 10 seconds left. Well, the referee should come over and they're going to probably ask if they know it's short time. And when they're told, hey, there's eight seconds left. Well, what we're going to remind everybody is that even if the penalty time's expired, if the faceoff is not over, we the penalty the guy cannot come out of the penalty box. Now, the faceoff can be over by we getting possession, or the faceoff can be over by the ball crossing the defensive line area, which is that long line at the 30-yard line on most football fields. So sometimes the ball could be on the ground for 15, 20 seconds. That player, if he releases early, is going to go back in and serve an additional 30 seconds. They cannot enter the field until the face-off is over. And here's another rule change. Again, this came from USA Lacrosse. This is not a rule change for us this year. We've had it for a couple of years. It doesn't happen often, but if within the last three minutes of a game, and it's a two-goal game, if the team that's ahead takes a foul, not the team that's behind, if the team that's ahead takes a foul, and the penalty time that the referee assesses exceeds the amount of time left in the game, 
the game will continue till the penalty time's over. So there's a whole lot of different scenarios, and I'm not going to go into them, but to, to break it down simply, if there's 40 seconds left in the game and the other team's winning by two goals, and the team that's winning by two goals slashes somebody, and the referee assesses one minute, well, the game's now not ending in 40 seconds. The game's now going to go at least another minute. Now, if they score and there's no more penalty, then the game's going to end when the game should have ended. If five seconds into the extra time they score, um, you know, the game's over if it's a two-goal game. So, but this is just a rule. Um, coaches, you should be familiar because it's very possible, because I've done it too as a referee, we'll forget about this rule because it's not something we do in high school. So it's important that everybody understands how it's to be implemented. So here's some clarifications. Um, lacrosse numbers for 20 some years were climbing and climbing and climbing and then COVID hit and things kind of plateaued and some programs are starting to have some numbers issues and particularly at the fifth and sixth grade level. And uh, what's happening is some programs, they might not have quite enough kids. Um, this can be on a combined fifth and sixth grade team. It could be on a fifth grade or a sixth grade team. It could be any level. But here's what's important for people to understand. If the game's a 10 v 10 game, legally you can play with as few as seven players on the field. That's true whether it's a result of penalties. You can never go below seven players on the field, meaning a goalie three and three, or if you just don't have enough players. So if a program shows up and it's a sixth grade game and they only have eight players, um, a couple different things can happen now. If the opposing team has 20 players and they want to give them a couple players, that's totally okay. That's, you know, the, there's no standings in sixth grade. It doesn't make a difference. Um, or if both teams are short on numbers, you can agree to play eight on eight. You could also, the other team doesn't have to agree to play with less players. They can say, well, I'm keeping my 10 out there. And then you could just play shorthanded the whole game. Um, but there's a lot of different options. If you do agree to play with less than 10 players, you could play, if you have nine, you could play three, two, three. So obviously we're not talking the goalies in addition to this 3D to the two middies, three attack. You can play a three, one, three, you can play a two, two, two. Um, there's lots of different variations. You could also, if you had nine, you could go, if you had eight, you could go two, three, two. Um, there's a lot of different variations. Um, the only thing I'll say is this, is if pregame you agreed to play nine on nine, eight on eight, whatever it is, that's the way you're playing the game. If the team that has enough players starts to get behind by a couple goals, it's not going to be okay for them to then put their extra players out there. If you agree to play with less, that's how you're going to finish the game. Now, if more players from each team show up and you both have enough to put enough on the field, obviously that's different. So we can do this. The only time we wouldn't do this is if it's an eighth grade game that counts towards the playoffs. Obviously the other team doesn't have to agree to play with less. And a 10v10 games cannot be played with less than seven players. All right, we only got a few slides left. We're going to talk about some um, third grade rules, third and fourth grade 7v7 rules. And I'm just going to say it one more time now before we get done. I'm not monitoring the chat. I'm not monitoring the Q&A right now. We'll be doing that in just a few slides. I'll, I'll peek into the chat. I'll peek into the Q&A, and I'll try to answer some of your questions. So... Let's talk about the one pass rule. This is an important rule. The logic behind the rule is we don't want one player um, picking the ball up in the defensive zone, running the entire length of the field and shooting and scoring. It's not good lacrosse. It's not good for the game. It's not good for anybody. So what we have now is a one pass rule. The pass must be received on the offensive side of the field. So the goalie can't make the save pass it to a midi or a D here, and then run, that doesn't count as the one pass. Whoever's receiving the pass has to be on the offensive side of the field. The goalie can make the save and pass it to an attackman right here. That's fine. And then the other thing to understand, the pass doesn't need to be caught because anytime the ball hits the ground on this side, even if a player runs across and gets the ball checked out of his stick, accidentally drops it out of his stick, once the ball hits the ground, the one ball uh, pass... Uh, is no longer needed. Um, the only exception to that is a player can't run across, and if he's on a nice turf field, he can't intentionally roll the ball in front of himself. He can't, uh, and then pick it up. But if, it, if anytime there's a pass, whether it's caught or not, 
Now the one pass rule is off. Now, once that's met, unless the ball gets back across midfield again, they will not need another pass. So even if the goalie makes a save, he passes it to a defender, they're trying to clear the ball, but they don't clear it, and the offense picks it up again. If the ball did not go across midfield, they do not need another pass. Only time you need to pass is you're going from the defensive end to the offensive end. So here's where it gets a little bit confusing. This rule is not changed in several years, but we still have some confusion. If the face-off meeting, that meaning the actual guy who took the face-off, if 14 White took the face-off here, if he wins the ball, no matter where he picks it up, he doesn't have to pass, all right? Reason for that is coaches were teaching their kids not to move off of these guys, so he'd be running in, he can't shoot, and nobody's open to pass to. So this guy, it doesn't matter where he picks the ball up, he doesn't need to pass. Now, the way it works for these wing area guys is if White's wing guys, and remember, they can be anywhere here, if a white wing guy picks the ball up over here, he doesn't need to pass. He's on his offensive side. He's not transitioning, right? But if they pick it up back here, he is going to need to pass at some point because they're going to be bringing the ball across midfield. So if you remember it that way, the pass is needed whenever the ball crosses midfield. That's the easiest way to remember it. So I'm going to go through this quickly just so coaches understand Um if you call your program director and say, hey, I got an issue, um, I need to change a game, your program director might not be as eager as he has in the past to change it because now there's uh, things called game change fees. And what that means is this. Um, you, they can, you can change any game you want as long as you do it 15 days in advance. The reason the 15 days is in there is because that's when we assign the officials. And once we assign the officials on it, there needs to be a really good reason you're going to change it. Now, you still can if you have to, even if it's not a good reason, but the program's going to get charged a $50 uh, game change fee. This is for non-weather related. We're not talking about, you know, weather changes, um, game day weather changes. This is for things like, you know, um, they didn't realize, uh, the coach didn't realize he wasn't going to be in town that night. Well, you get a coach from another team to coach. Uh, they didn't realize that there was a school function, that there was some other issue going on where a bunch of the boys weren't going to be available. Cause we've had games changed because one of the travel teams was holding a practice and a few kids weren't going to be able to make it. So the coach wanted to change the game. So again, 15 days, that game's locked in. You can still change it, but the program's going to get charged $50 per game for every game they try to change. That game change fee was new last year. It did its job because last year it significantly cut down on the number of game changes that we had. But what we've had for many years is what's called the 48-hour rule. And this is for non-weather-related cancellations. Again, just like above. And what that means is if we're within 48 hours of game time and you need to change or cancel a game, the referees are going to get paid in full for the games. If you cancel two, they're going to get paid for two. If you cancel three, three. If you cancel one, one. All right? Um the game change fee up above wasn't designed to be an income generator for anybody. It was designed to be a deterrent from programs changing the games. However, the 48-hour rule, it's really just what's fair to the referees. Because if you call on Thursday night and you cancel games on a Saturday morning, well, that referee might have been counting on that money to go grocery shopping Saturday night. And it's not fair that for something that was avoidable, you cancel a game and now they don't have an opportunity to pick up another game because once we're within 48 hours, they're probably now not going to work on a day that they could have been working someplace else. So the one thing I will say though is if they are paying, if they are doing the 48 hour rule, they're not, they don't also have to pay the referees, uh, pay the game change fee. So it's either you're paying the referees or the game change fee. And the reason we're telling coaches is that just so you understand why your program directors might not be too eager to, um, uh, to change games. Then there's the two hour rule. And this has to do with weather. If you have a six 30 game on a weekday, you got to give two hours notice to the referees. As long as they're notified more than two hours in advance, there's no fee due. Uh, less than two hours. The referees are going to get $30 each. Now it's one $30 fee. If you're canceling three games or five games, they're not getting $30 per game. They're only getting $30 for the first game. Um, and that's only if you wait until you're within that two hour window. And the fees do whether they arrive at the field or not. And what the home team's responsible for doing is calling each official and notifying them. 
If it's early in the day and you want to try sending a text message or an email, that's fine, but that's not considered proper notification. The referees need to be called. So if they don't acknowledge your email or text and you're coming up on two hours, you need to call them. And if you've got multiple games, you need to make sure that there's more, not more than two refs because if it's normally it would be four games, but it could be three games. If there's multiple games, there could be two sets of refs. You got to make sure that they all get called. So two, two or three slides left. We're ready to go here. What should officials expect from coaches? We expect you to control the conduct of your coaches, players, parents, and spectators. Have your digital IDs ready, all right? You should have your phone with you. So when the referee walks in the field, you should see them coming. You should get the app open. You should show them. It shouldn't take uh, several minutes to pull up these digital IDs. We ask that you have a basic knowledge of the rules. We start games on time whenever possible. You provide a reliable adult goal, ball, uh, timekeeper. You have balls on the end line, all right? Once pregame, when you put balls out there, that does not complete your requirement. The home team's required to keep refilling those balls. And I'll let you in on a secret. In sixth grade and below, the referees are not going to care if you refill the end line balls. Because if you want to waste half the kids playing time while they're chasing balls, the, the referees aren't going to care because the clock's running. But in seventh and eighth grade, we're going to warn you once. Maybe we'll warn you twice to replace the end line balls. But you can actually get a delay of game penalty for not having end line balls available. Oh, and the last one was next uh, team up needs to be ready to go. This is my pet peeve. And what I'm talking about here is you got several games in a row and the game that's going on now is 15, 20 minutes behind. And when that game ends, if we're behind, the other two teams should be there on the sideline, ready to walk on the field, but way too often they're not. And they're still doing their line drills, 50 yards in each direction. And we as referees have to go get them. Well, to me, that's extremely disrespectful. Everybody should know we're behind. You should be there on the sideline, ready to step on the field. So on the other side, what should coaches expect from officials? That they arrive on time and not leave early. There is a huge caveat here. The, the thing is on a weeknight, almost all of us officials are coming from a high school game. And whether it's a four o'clock, 4.30, we don't have A, any control on whether the game started on time and B, we don't have any control over when the game ends. So uh, if a referee arrives late, you know they may step on the field, what they're told is first dead ball they get, they should come over. First opportunity they get, they should come over and just say, hey, sorry, coach. Um, I was at a high school game and wherever, and it did started late or end, ended late, whatever, and I got here as fast as I could. Um, leaving early, the only time they should ever really leave early is if they have a Saturday afternoon game um, and you had some morning games and the games were running late and they've got to get to their high school game. The high school games will always take priority over the youth games. And here's a big one because it happens every year. The referees should not be asking uh, coaches to start games before the time they're in Zebo M4. And if they do, tell your program director coaches and the program director should notify me. So if you got a game and it ends at um, 7.30 and the next game's not in the uh, Zebo Web till 7.45, the referees should not be telling you we're starting now. Now, if both coaches are ready and they say, hey, we're ready to go, that's okay. But it should be the coaches telling the referees, not the referees telling the coaches. And I do want to know if a referee does that. We should answer reasonable questions about calls. However, this depends on the situation. If I got a loose ball push and the other team's entitled to a fast restart, I'm not going to delay the restart to turn around and explain to you why um, it was a foul. And then... The referees, we should be courteous, not argumentative. And what I'll say is this. Um, how you ask and interact with us is going to have a lot to do with how you get it back. Uh, most referees are really good. Some guys have shorter fuses than others. But the tone you use with us is going to set the tone for how we interact the whole game. So let's try to keep it uh, nice and courteous to each other. So um, we... Uh, I'm going to pause now and I'm going to answer some questions. Now I do have some more seven V seven rules coming up. So if you're a seven V seven coach and you want to hang on, that's fine. If not, I'm going to answer some questions now. And then we have a few slides left that are seven V seven specific, but because I know probably most of the coaches 
don't coach that. Um, I decided to hold this on the end. So let me just open up here and see what we got as far as uh, questions. Okay, one question was, what if you don't have a second goalie? Well, um, whether he, he gets hurt or whether he was have to serve a penalty, if you don't have a second goalie, the game's going to be over. The other team can lend you a goalie if they want, like if he gets hurt. But other than that, the game would be over. Um, somebody asked, yes, there'll be access to this recording later. Um, as far as the in-home... We don't necessarily make it that it has to be the in-home. What it should be, if somebody's going to serve the penalty for the goalie, it's supposed to be a starting defensive player. Fast restarts we talked about. Yeah, somebody mentioned second flag down. Just That's a good rule clarification. Anytime we've got a flag down, if there's a second flag, we kill the play. So that, that slow whistle goes away when there's a second flag, whether you're in high school varsity or below. Okay. Okay. There, well, you're right. Somebody's asking about not taking two faceoffs in a row. That's for the seven v seven games. That's going to come up. So let me go over to the other side now. I'm just reading questions real quick here. I answered the question about having a second goalie. And I think I answered the question. Okay, I think I answered most of these. If you still have a question, if you want to send me an email at randy at njlacrosse.com, I'll be glad to answer your email. I'm going to move on now. Those of you that don't coach below, um, don't coach 7v711, you're welcome to stay on. Um, but these last few sides are going to be specific to 7v7. And I will answer more questions at the end. And this is only a few slides. So if you wanted to hang on to try to answer some more questions, uh, ask some more questions. I will try to answer more in a couple minutes. So some 7v7 rules. We play one goalie, two, two, and two. You have to keep four players on the offensive side of the field, and you must keep uh, three players back. That means two defenders and a goalie. Doesn't have to be the goalie, but three players back. As far as field sizes, referees are told, we're not getting involved in measuring fields. If it's a safe field, as long as it's significantly smaller than a big field we're playing you can use portable creases um the only requirement though is the, i've played 77 games where there are no creases because we really don't want cones out there because that's a tripping hazard but the referees can just estimate where the crease would be we just want these kids to learn how to play the game and have some fun the only requirement though is the goals must be six foot by six foot they can't use any smaller goals so for 7v7, third and fourth grade, now um, this is 7v7, there's a new procedure for man up, man down. So in 7v7, um, the player committing the foul will remove from the game, and they're supposed to sit in the penalty box, where in the past we just kind of let them go to the bench. The whole thought process here on A for the fourth grade 10v10, now serving penalties, and this process was, the consensus was, there wasn't enough of a consequence at these levels when a player did something wrong. So this is try to teach them that they did do something wrong and there's a consequence for that. So now the referee is going to come over, he's going to make his call, and that player has to stay in the box as if they were serving a time-serving penalty. Now, when we go to restart play, now if the team that was fouled is entitled to a free clear, they're going to get their free clear. But the other team, the new player that's coming on for this player who served the foul has to stay in the penalty area they do not get to run on the field until we've restarted play. So what it does is give you a few several seconds of an odd man situation. It's just a little bit extra deterrent. Um, you're not truly playing man up, man down, but there is an odd man advantage. And remember, if they're getting the free clear, they're starting on the offensive side of the field. Um, there's not going to be a pass required because they're not transitioning from the defensive side. So they won't need a pass. So a lot of these fields, um, there's no wing area available. So if that's the case, they, the, the wing guys have to stand with one foot on the sideline. They can be on either sideline, but they have to be relatively near the midfield line. They don't get the 10 yards like they do in each direction for a full field because that would put them almost down to goal line on some of these fields. They have to be near the midfield line 
but they can be on either side. All the defense and attack have to be behind goal line extended, GLEs, goal line extended. But unlike in the past, last year we changed the rule, which this was a good rule change, is now everybody's released on the whistle. We used to say they had to stay back, but if you've ever done or watched one of these games, the kids just naturally wander out. and Now they're all released, but they have to stay on sides. Um, so they can all come out on the whistle, but they if the ball's over here, the right number of players have to stay on each side of the field. We do have at this level a rule that no player can take two faceoffs in a rule, uh, two faceoffs in a row. The purpose of this rule is if you're running up against a kid and some of these kids, even in third and fourth grade, if they've been practicing enough or the parents been sending them to the extra training, they're just dominant. And I've done these games where prior to this rule, the kid would literally win every faceoff. So that's an unfair advantage. So um, this is though the coaches have to keep track of this. The referees are not keeping track of who took the last face off. Now, if this is a game and everybody's just average and coaches, you both agree, you're just not going to enforce this rule. That's up to you. But a coach can enforce this rule, but he's got to point it out to the referee before they go down. Once they go down, if the referee yells, hey, 12 took the last face off, we're not changing it now. But if you see if 12 is a good face off, Mitty, and he took the last one, coach, and you see him walking out there for the next one, you could say to the, uh, the referee, Mr. Referee, 12 took the last face off. And the referee should fix that if that's the case. So this is what we look on a face off. Attack and deer behind goal line extended. The wing guys have to be near the midfield line, but they can be on either side. Remember, this is not hockey. They, can, they don't have to be on the same side. Um, they can be on either side of the field and either side of the line. All right. If you hung around, thank you. I'm going to go through the chat and the Q&A one more time to see if there's anything I missed. Okay, I understand there's no playing up to, there's no exception. Um, so unfortunately for whoever asked the question about second graders, second graders cannot play on a combined third and fourth grade team. There's no way the league's going to give you an exception for that. We put the rule in to prevent it. I just answered the other part of that, second, third, and fourth. 7v7, to see. Okay, one question. When the helmet coming off rule, that applies to the goalie too. And if you don't have another goalie, well, it's the same situation I talked before. So if somebody asked about the timekeepers, can you have one team do the game clock and another team do the penalties? The home team, you can, but it's the home team's responsibility. The visiting team does not have to do it. Now, what I'll say is this, if we're talking sixth grade and below, it's not unreasonable to ask the referees to keep the game time because it's running time. But trust me, you don't want them keeping it in the 10 minute stop time because there's too often, first of all, I won't as a referee because I don't want to be looking at my watch to make sure it started, make sure it stopped. My eyes need to be on the field. But for running time, we're really not looking at our clocks, but a couple times. So if, if you're in a situation um, if you want it for the running time games, let the referees keep the game time and let the uh, and then have your one timekeeper do the penalty time. That's OK. Um, so somebody asked about the conduct foul for not playing the ball. Um, well, I will say this with the icebreaker tournament that they're talking about. Some some people might not have been to a rules meeting and that's a rule change this year. So Matt, who asked this question, hopefully they get it right. If not. You can let your program director know. He can send me an email, and I'll try to re-educate the referee. Well, let's just see. Yeah. Uh, guys, the, the number of player variations, whether it's 2-3-2, two, two, and if you have less than 10, as long as both teams agree and you have less, um, then uh, you have more than 7 and less than 10, That whatever you come up with is fine. And, yes, clamping – Somebody asked the question is, is clamping playing the ball? Yes, clamping is playing the ball. Okay, somebody asked fourth grade, poke and check only. Well, is, it, the question is, is fourth grade poke, and, uh, poke check only or is slashing allowed? Well, slashing is not allowed, but you are allowed to what we call slap check now, the horizontal check. Um, but it's got to be reasonable. Like I said, they can't be chopping wood. But the, the rule to poke, lift, and only chop down from below the shoulder does not exist anymore. They got When they got rid of the one-handed checks, they got rid of that too. Um, just going through these. Okay, what grade levels can we sub on the fly? Well, you can sub on the fly at any level. 
You could do that in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, right up. Seventh and eighth grade, you can only sub on the fly or you can sub during a dead ball, but you can't get a horn in seventh and eighth grade. But subbing on the fly, and again, that's another rule change from USA Lacrosse because USA Lacrosse, I think, says you have to wait for a dead ball or something like that. We allow subbing on the fly anytime in our league. In fourth grade, if it's a 10 v 10 game, every kid can take the face off. It's if it's seven, because the question is face off. So fourth grade, one kid can take every face off. Yes, if it's 10 v 10, no, if it's seven v seven. If you have, if you have a timekeeper on the sideline, do they need a pass? No, okay. I thought we go in over that earlier, but maybe I didn't say it. Um, the timekeeper, the person keeping time does not need a digital ID. However, they can't be coaching. So uh, even if you appoint a coach to be the timekeeper, well, they're not a coach that game anymore, right? So when there's a timeout, they're staying in the box. They're not going into your huddle. Halftime between quarters, they're staying in the penalty area. They're not going into the huddles with the teams. So they do not need a pass, but they're also not coaching at the same time. So I just answered the other question about the two face-off rule. Is there a crease count for third and fourth grade once the goalie has possession? Yes, there's still a four-second rule. Now, most referees are going to be a little slower on their count for third and fourth grade than they are above, but technically the goalie still only has four seconds to get rid of the ball. All right. Again, what I'll say is if you have any other questions, my email um, is randy at NJ Lacrosse. Um, I'm going to, okay, there's still questions. Yes, all 10 v 10 games are man up, man down, including fourth grade. Somebody just asked that. Um, in seventh grade, how many times? Okay, the counts. Um, we don't really go through that too much. Um, next year, we're probably going to put in some actual more basic rules question for coaches. So in seventh and eighth grade, when you play high school rules, when you get the ball on your defensive end, you have 20 seconds to get it across midfield. All right. The referees wear a beeper. They're not going to do a physical count. It's on their hip. And once you get it across midfield, you have 10 seconds to get it in the attack box. So that's the 20 and 10 that I talked about earlier. 20 seconds to get it out of your defensive zone across midfield and 10 seconds once you get it across midfield to get it in the attack box. Uh, let's see. All right. Okay. For running time games, clock stops as soon as the penalty is called. The game clock does not stop. The penalty time is stop time once we go. So games do not, running time games are running time games. In a running time game, the only time the time time's going to stop is if a team takes a timeout or a referee calls a timeout for an injury or some other logistical issue. But the game clock does not stop for a penalty. Only the penalty time is stop time. So once, once we start the penalty, if we got a dead ball, the penalty time stops, but the game clock keeps going. So that was a good question. All right. It says, I think only if the faceoff player wins it clean, otherwise they need a pass. For the one pass rule, um, I know I went through it quickly, but if the faceoff midi wins it, it doesn't matter whether they win it clean. If 14 pops the ball behind him and picks it up, but he took the faceoff, he doesn't need to pass, all right? It's only the two guys that took the face off that get that courtesy though. If a wing area gets it, it depends on where they picked it up. So if the face, the guy who took the actual face off picks it up, they don't need to pass, even if they pick the ball up behind them. One thing I'll say about these one pass rule and whatnot, if you get together with the referee before the game and, and go over it, so you're all on the same page, because yes, we have issues with this. It doesn't get enforced the same every game, but as long as it gets enforced the same for each team, that's the main thing, but we do want some consistency. So try to talk it out. Okay. All right, guys, I'm going to say not sign off. There will be a recording of this available at some point. Um, I'll put something out. So everybody knows everybody have a great night. Thanks for signing in.